I have to admit, I have a long-standing appreciation of the wicked problem methodology and approach. And, and climate change is a wicked problem. So take it away. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions you preloaded me with, and I thought at least for 10 right. seconds about. Okay. <laughs> I'm Richard Delavan. I'm your host here at Wicked Problems. Uh, we are well past the time when idiocy should be defining public discourse or policy. And we are well past the time when special interest groups that are well-funded should be delaying climate action. Members of Parliament, um, many of them are wonderful people, many of them are highly educated. Uh, many of them have the STEM backgrounds of illiterate newts. And so, yeah, it is what it is. Hydrogen for energy imports really is saying we're going to take our cost for our energy of last resort and multiply it by 10 and be competitive somehow with economies which just electrify for vastly less cost. There's an old saying, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. For 15 years, Michael Barnard has been writing about the future of energy and climate tech. Not a few years from now, but decades. And every time I see him either calmly explaining or ripping to shreds a supposed climate solution that he doesn't see supported by the facts, as in the math, the chemistry, and the physics, I'm reminded of that line. Michael has been arguing in Forbes and Cleantechnica and other places, and to executives that he advises, that the simple is usually better, and that any decarbonization path that doesn't start and end with electrification has a pretty big burden of proof. Just a little over a month before COP28 begins, and in the week the International Energy Agency set out its World Energy Outlook for 2023, and Michael Liebreich updated his hydrogen ladder, a lot of the facts seem to be headed his way, so we thought it would be a good time to try to catch up with him. We talk about hydrogen, CCUS, China, EVs, strategy, and a whole bunch of other stuff, including the IEA report and COP. I came away from this chat with a lot to think about and some great recommendations for my reading list, and I hope you will too. If you like this conversation, do check us out at news.wickedproblems.uk, where you'll find our newsletter. You can also find other episodes with myself and my co-host, Claire Breedy, there or on your favorite podcast app. Tell us what you think and share your ideas for future guests at news.wickedproblems.uk. Find Richard Delavan, Claire Brady on LinkedIn, and you'll find links in the show notes. Now let's kick things off. I'm here with the very generous and patient Michael Barnard, noted climate futurist, advising companies and organizations around the world about what the decarbonization scenarios 80 years from now will look like. I'm so delighted you could join us today, Michael. Thanks for having me, Richard. I have to admit I have a long-standing appreciation of the wicked problem methodology and approach, and, and climate change is a wicked problem. So I wanted to start by asking about the genesis for the Forbes series, these 15 basically climate actions going to work, starting with Electrify Everything. I'm not going to ask you to go through the whole thing, but you know, you say you've been iterating on this for years. Mm -hmm. What led you to try to make things this simple for people? Uh, so poof, for about 15 years, I have been looking at every segment of the climate problem. And because I'm a nerd and because I'm curious, I've quantified the scale of the problem. And then I've looked at all the major purported solutions. And because I'm a nerd, I have um, a basic STEM background, so I can do chemistry and physics. I, I have a, an economics and fiscal background because I've worked on billion-dollar strategic transformation and technology programs globally. So I can assess whether something, yeah, the likely cost case for things. And I have a sufficient background in cognitive science, having studied that, worked with people like John Cook and Stephen Lewandowski, cognitive scientists, who've helped me understand what humans will actually accept. So it has to be able to work. It has to be able to be competitive fiscally. And it has to be something human beings will actually internalize and accept. It's kind of the three things I, I filter everything on. And so for 15 years, I've gone through every major chunk of the climate change problem and said, okay, let's apply this process and get stuff wrong. And that's a big part of my process is getting stuff wrong, by the way. I live by post-publication humiliation. I get a lot of experts who say, by the way, Mike, and I go, oh, that's interesting. Um, and the cognitive science thing means also that I really understand that I have biases too. And so I fight right. to avoid those biases. I, you know, I live and die by a lot of Kahneman's work. And so I always try to run the math get the data, run the scenarios, find the data. And after I'd done that for 10 years or so, I kind of had all the big chunks. And now I'm uh, iterating through those, and I've got tremendous more depth on each of those points. Like I've done projections for iron and steel out through 2100, 
looked at all the major technology sets and made at least a projection of demand and which technologies would work. Same for aviation, same for marine shipping, same for grid storage. And people tell me when I'm wrong, which is nice. Well, that is nice. I suppose people who are not super familiar with your work, if they're only seeing you interact on LinkedIn, for example, they might be reminded of something else that I saw you say, which is my complete disregard for people's feelings and my ruthless adherence to running the numbers in multiple domains is what makes me valuable for the advice. And I, I sometimes see the ruthlessness and the lack of worrying about other people's feelings. But uh, I think that when you take in context that you've been trying to be consistent on things and take the, take it on the chin when someone does come up and say, hey, Michael, what about this? Um, whereas a lot of people don't seem to have that. But I love the acerbic kind of, you don't seem to suffer fools, I guess is what I'm saying, Michael. Oh, we are well past the time when idiocy should be defining public discourse or policy. And we are well past the time when special interest groups that are well-funded should be delaying climate action. We're about a month away from COP kicking off in Dubai. We are just finished with Fatih Barol launching the IEA's World Economic World Energy Outlook earlier this week, which seems to chime increasingly with a lot of your, your point of view. Um, but where should we be keeping our eyes open for where these opportunities for delay are still coming at us? Um, hydrogen for energy and carbon capture and sequestration. Hydrogen for energy, it doesn't pass economic sniff tests. It is entirely possible to use hydrogen as an energy carrier. It's just inefficient, hard to manage, hard to distribute, and expensive. And so since we have the alternatives of electrification, heat pumps, you kind of go, okay, hydrogen for energy doesn't pass the remotest economic sniff test. So why is it being pushed? Well, Michael Liebrich says it best. Um, the fossil fuel companies can't lose by pushing hydrogen for energy. Either they delay action for a decade, or they get governments to give them massive amounts of money to make blue hydrogen uh, so their hydrocarbon reserves are still worth something in the future. Um, and so that's a form of predatory delay. Uh, natural gas distribution companies, the ones who pump natural gas into commercial and residences to, for heat and cooking. Well, they're undergoing the same kind of thing. They're pretending that they can put hydrogen in their pipelines and hydrogen boilers and hydrogen stoves safely in people's homes, when in fact they should be strategically shutting down their just gas distribution grids, sub-isolation network by sub-isolation network, to avoid utility death spiral. Utrecht in the Netherlands is doing that. They're a great global example of how to do it. They're converting people to district heating or heat pumps or both. Um, and their process is moving through that in a very strategic and well-communicated way with lots of support from the transition for the individuals. And the utility death spiral is a big problem. The utility death spiral basically says a utility has a natural monopoly as the number of people in that not natural monopoly area diminish, the customers then they get to a point where they have to maintain the entire network and quality on the entire network, but don't have sufficient revenues to do that. And so that it gets to a point where it collapses under its own weight. And then we have a problem of a very unsafe gas distribution network that's full of potentially flammable and explosive gases. So we want to avoid that. We want to, and they, they're not going to do it by themselves. So they need assistance from outside, but They've been fighting climate action for years and pretending they could use renewable uh, hydrogen or renewable natural gas, which is a rounding error. Mm -hmm. They're pretending they can use hydrogen, which is an absurdist fallacy, vastly more expensive for consumers and vastly less safe, four times less safe. That's who they are. But here we are, and hydrogen, particularly after the invasion of Ukraine, has rocketed up the European agenda and policy. And you see people, particularly in the activist space, worried about lock-in. Um, with billions of subsidies going towards building a pipeline for hydrogen between Spain and France, for example, and lots of other things for support of electrolyzers and blue or green hydrogen shipped from the Gulf or even a pipeline across the, the Med from, from Algeria to uh, southern France. Maybe just even for listeners who, who maybe don't have quite the STEM background that you do, why hydrogen is just so difficult to work with. I mean, we've, we've all seen the, the differences in terms of efficiencies. Why can't we just put some 10% blend hydrogen into the network? Just see what happens. Um, why is that not really a thing? Well, sure. Uh, so let's start with hydrogen in a pipeline blended with natural gas. Um, the hydrogen in most pipelines, is, the steel in most pipelines, doesn't react well with hydrogen. Hydrogen's a more problematic 
molecule because it gets into the cracks and it causes embrittlement and it causes some problems, especially at joints. And so you can kind of get in Europe about 20% maximum, in the United States about 10% maximum before you run into metal problems. And 20%, that sounds good. It sounds like a 20% reduction, except that hydrogen is a lot lower. It's very energy dense by mass. Like every kilogram of hydrogen is about the same as a gallon of gasoline. But unfortunately, it's very diffuse. By volume, like cubic meters or a room full of hydrogen has a lot less energy than a room full of natural gas or a cubic meter of natural gas. And so when you mix 20% hydrogen, well, you're doing two things. You're requiring more energy to push it through the network. You're getting less energy per unit of volume through the network. At the end, you get about maybe 6% reduction at about double the cost because hydrogen is vastly more expensive. Let, let's take a couple of just pure economic examples. I did an assessment um, of a green hydrogen in Namibia project intended to ship hydrogen all the way to uh, Europe. And that assessment found that um, just putting hydrogen into an equivalent tanker to a liquid natural gas tanker would be five times the cost per unit of energy delivered. I'll give you another example. DNV, um, their oil and gas side, did a, a big study recently, and they said making hydrogen offshore wind farms and then putting it in pipes and delivering it onshore would be really cheap. It would be the cheapest possible way by 2050. And that turned out to be three euros per kilogram in 2050, at just over, at their best possible price. And there's only a, mm -hmm. one problem with that. Um, a, it's a lot more than anybody expects to pay per kilogram of hydrogen. And, and when I say more, it's 10 times the cost per unit of energy of liquid natural gas. And liquid natural gas is already the most expensive form of energy societies use today. We, it's, the, it's the energy of last resort. So a hydrogen for energy imports really is saying, we're going to take our cost for our energy of last resort and multiply it by 10 and be competitive somehow with economies which just electrify for vastly less cost. And yet, once the math is explained, once the, some of the economics are explained, um, and yet here we are, we're still having these conversations mm -hmm. um, as if you know the, all the use cases, including vehicles like passenger vehicles. Yesterday, I don't want to get your, your thoughts on this in a moment, yesterday here in the UK, in the House of Commons, Prime Minister was asked a question on this Let's listen. Speaker, the UK is at risk of being left behind on hydrogen engines, hydrogen ice. Hey, hey. The EU and the USA are now recognizing hydrogen combustion engines as zero hey, hey. emissions and are supporting their industries as all viable zero carbon technologies will be needed, particularly for our HGVs, according yes. to the RHA. Hey, hey. So I'm working with Borg Warner Fenia on ice and many MPs because this is crucial for UK jobs, skills and manufacturing. Yes. Will my right honourable friend commit to urge Urgently extending the scope of the Automotive Transformation Fund industrialization grants Brilliant. to include hydrogen engines yeah. so we win the ice yeah, race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Mr. Speaker, the government is determined to ensure that the UK remains one of the best locations in the world for automotive manufacturing. Hydrogen fuel cells and their upstream supply chain are already in scope. And on the same day, Shell announces that they're going to, in fact, scale back their light vehicle hydrogen sector. So even what are the earliest and biggest proponents in old oil and gas of hydrogen? Even they have finally said, guys, maybe this isn't really going to work out the way we thought. How do you explain, uh, you know, to people who, for whom that this, this just doesn't seem to go in? This gets the cognitive science. There's uh, a few things going on. You know, uh, you and I, and perhaps we're talking about the Upton Sinclair quote, it is difficult to get a man to understand something of his salary depends upon him believing the opposite. It's a cognitive science tree, um, and tribalism is part of it. But let's just start with internal combustion engines. I've talked to uh, leaders at Mann and Varzilla and Bosch, and the challenge is if you're, a lot of your intellectual capital is based upon uh, the internal combustion engine, if, unless you find something to burn in it, and burning something in your internal, in your pistons maintain, maintains a primary case. All of your intellectual capital diminishes to no value. And that's the case for virtually every internal combustion manufa engine manufacturer. 
There will be some internal combustion engines. There'll be big ones on ships that cross oceans. That's about it in terms of major use cases. There'll be some left natural gas combined cycle generators with diminishing capacity factors. But other than that, you know, those are going away. And so for them, they need hydrogen, burning hydrogen or burning synthetic fuels or burning biofuels on land, a completely wasteful process where we can just put batteries and things instead. Um, and so they're spending a lot of money trying to do that. So that's the, the internal combustion engine manufacturers. You, you, you know why they do that. I'm not sure where the MP has a, uh, if they have a engine manufacturing facility in their district. And you can just hear the executives saying to them, well, we're just going to burn hydrogen and internal combustion engine. And members of parliament, um, many of them are wonderful people. Many of them are highly educated. Uh, many of them have the STEM backgrounds of illiterate newts. And so, you know, it is what it is. And, and I think that's it. If you're relying on the advice of other people, and before I, I completely trash uh, Siobhan Bailey, that I want to also just give her props and that she has been on a lot of other aspects of the transition, extremely good. She's only been in Parliament since 2019. One of her early statements was about the need for reskilling industries around the UK to promote economic growth for the future. Things like only 5% of mechanics know how to fix an electric vehicle, uh, calling for further education and lots of investment to be able to upskill and reskill from mechanics to electricians, to plumbers, people who have a vested interest in putting in gas boilers to figure out that maybe putting in heat bumps might be a perfectly fine way to make a living. Although that seemed like a particularly teenage thing to have said. On other things, she has been reasonably solid in terms of the instinct well, to say that the future is there. This gets back to that next piece, the advisors. Who are the advisors? What are they saying? Um, as we think about the advisors, let's start with the fossil fuel industry. Uh, let's be really transparent on this. Unless hydrogen for energy becomes a primary pathway for the economy, the hydrocarbon reserves of the fossil fuel companies are worth pennies on the dollar. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. That means that their stock price is worth pennies on the dollar. They have used those reserves as collateral for debt-based acquisitions um, and, you know, debt-based exploration. And that's all of a sudden those debts become problematic. And so that's one group of people. Um, we will we'll still be, you know, pumping oil in 2100, but we'll be pumping perhaps 10 to 15%. Paul Martin thinks it's 15 to 20%. I think it's a little lower, you know, but we still are going to use petrochemicals. We still, we're not going to make gasoline or diesel out of the uh, oil. We're going to make plastics and other durable goods. And we're going to use some industrial feedstocks. There's nothing in the process that requires us to burn three quarters of a barrel of oil. You know, that's not a requirement. We can still extract it and do other stuff with it. And it's useful. It's a good hydrocarbon reserve, um, but it's not, 16 billion tons a year powering our global economy. Um, and so that's problematic for them. You can understand why even, and I'll, I'll say this as carefully as I can, um, this isn't an Upton Sinclair moment. The fossil fuel industry has known since the 70s that climate change is real, their product is the primary cause of it, and they've intentionally undertaken a significant disinformation campaign. They've lied to a lot of people pure self-serving venality on the behalf of stakeholders. And some of them say, think they're doing it for good causes, uh, but there is no longer a moral case for fossil fuels. The moral case for fossil fuels did exist until there were alternatives, mm -hmm. now there are alternatives. So let's talk about the surround for those people though. Suppose you're a member of parliament in Norway. Well, a significant portion of your country's identity and your country's wealth right. is from fossil fuels. And you're right. probably not STEM literate as a member of parliament. And so you're going to say, you know, the CEO or one of the executive vice presidents of Equinor comes up to you and, you know, we go for lunch and he said, and you ask them, well, what are we going to do? And they say blue hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Norway's got the cleanest natural gas ex extraction. And we've already in a, the sleep nurse facility putting CO2 underground. We'll just do that and we'll sell hydrogen instead. And by the way, hydrogen is more valuable per cubic meter than oil is. So we'll actually our revenues will go up. Now, the MP in Norway is going to be very, is going to love that story. 
That's a story mm-hmm. that says we don't have to radically transform. We can stay right. the same. Let's take another example. Um, suppose you are um, in HSBC. You're an investment banker and a de- you know, uh, you're a banker whose client is Equinor. Just for example, to pick on names, um, this is not unusual across any financial institution or, or any fossil fuel company. Um, but HSBC, you, your entire, you've got a division that's devoted to servicing Equinor's debt and its investments and managing the relationships. You've got an entire set of relationships with people in Equinor and you're a numbers woman or man. But that's not a STEM numbers. That's financial numbers. You don't have STEM mm-hmm. skills yourself most of the time. And so you say, well, what makes sense from a science perspective? Well, who are you going to ask? If they Equinor, can you tell me what right. the science, which one's going to work out? And the, and the STEM the people at Equinor will say, blue hydrogen and your debt is safe. And in fact, our reserves are going to become more valuable. And as a person in the financial industry, you're going to say, oh, that's great news. And you're going to be in this bubble. And so you kind of see how this bubble of reinforcement of the wrong answer emerges and is enforced by a sense of tribalism because you're dealing with these people constantly. Mm -hmm. You trust them. You have longstanding relationships with them. And they're telling you something you really want to believe is true. And is that feature that's getting worse? I mean, we hear a lot in political discourse about the fact that we're all living in the kind of a epistemic, different realities, this idea, the Overton window, the idea that where I grew up and probably a little bit around the same time when you grew up, Michael, that there was a limited number of news outlets. There was a ability to share a common set of facts that informed, but it's a different world we live in now where people can kind of just only take the information that suits their own existing priors. Is that problem getting worse? And is that contributing to why it's been so difficult to be able to reset some of these conversations? At the risk of quoting somebody who's an idiot, um, reality doesn't, and facts don't care about your feelings. You can figure out who I'm asserting as an idiot um, based on that. As we move forward, the thermodynamics and chemistry and laws of physics, they're not going to be swayed by popular opinion. We are not decoupling globally as a set of economies. That's a pretense. There's some performative decoupling, which is occurring. But in reality, we're going to remain a highly trade-oriented organization, and we're going to have a lot of competition. That technology is no longer going to favor the West because China has been developing its own technologies. Even yesterday, I was talking to a global HVDC expert. HVDC is high voltage direct current, which Michael Bernard describes as being the pipelines of the new energy economy. And China is now selling its own high voltage direct current components and is building bigger HVDC lines than anybody else. And longer ones. Right. I, I did bad math, which is to say that it's hard to find the answers. Something like 80% of the world's high voltage direct current transmission is in China. You know, And they have the purchasing power parity advantage that it costs them 40% less to do something within their domestic supply chain compared to the West. You know, They achieved purchasing power parity in 2015, and now they're better than the UK, better than the EU, better than North America. But they also have rights law advantage. They've built more of everything. And so having built more, every other unit they deliver is cheap. And so the combination is a bit of a multiplier effect that makes it really hard. It makes it really easy for them to sell something at a profit at a price in many cases, North America or Europe can't even match. So we have a a transition that's occurring, which is part of the problem. The epistemic question, there's ways around that. Like the EU is really good. Brussels is a very evidence-based organization, subject to lobbying. There's a lot of STEM literate economics literate, thoughtful people who are moving forward with the right thing. We're at a hype cycle for hydrogen for energy. A lot of presentations occur in media that something's happening, but as you peel back the onion, they never get to final investment decision. You know, there's a a narrative which feeds hydrogen advocates and hydrogen fans beliefs that hydrogen for energy is growing rapidly. But as you peel back, you discover it's not. People abandoning hydrogen for energy, like uh, Lower Saxony, which oddly is a Bob Saxony. I don't know why it's called Lower Saxony. Nobody's explained it to me. It did something stupid. baden württemberger said, okay, let's do an assessment of hydrogen trains versus electric trains and do the math right. up front before committing to. And baden württemberger said, 
hydrogen trains would be three times as expensive total cost of ownership as battery and grid tied trains. So we're not going to do hydrogen. Lower Saxony, on the other hand, did the math after committing to hydrogen trains and then found that they were three times as expensive and said, we're not going to do this anymore. But Lower Saxony buying trains, that news circles the world. Lower Saxony right. abandoning trains, that gets into outlets that hydrogen advocates don't read. And so we, you have this perception of mm -hmm. success and the reality of failure. And that reality of failure is going to just continue because a hydrogen for energy just doesn't pencil up. I was looking at some of the clips that came after this MP's comments yesterday, and sure enough, outlets that I would have expected, GB News and Hydrogen Central and various others have picked up and amplified, promoted posts on various social channels that are showing BMW even making some favorable noise, Toyota with its experiment with hydrogen combustion engines, making a favorable noise about it. I think you can see that in operation, there are people who seem to be of good faith, like Ed Crooks at the Energy Gang with Mac, who seems to take a... We have to have a thousand flowers bloom and we're not really sure how this is going to work out just yet. You mentioned China, and I think this is an important debate that's going to really underpin the conversation between now and COP and Dubai. The, ch the fear of China essentially owning both critical mineral supply chains, EV supply chains and manufacturing, you know, swamping Western manufacturers. So is it basically your view that Western manufacturers just blew it, decided to just be, you know, rentiers and now it's too late. So, you know, basically screw them and let the, you know, the BYD inexpensive models come through Mexico and to the rest of North America or made in Hungary and shipped to the rest of the EU? Is there not an appropriate policy response that says we need to protect manufacturing jobs in these jurisdictions or what's your view? Too little, too late. I listened to a, a lecture by Joseph Stiglitz yesterday. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist. He was a chief leading economist for the World Bank, advised billions of exec leaders globally, vastly influential. He has a very gimlet eyed view on reality, which is to say he looks at reality. A lot of my perceptions are based upon what is good strategy. Good strategy starts mm -hmm. with, in Richard Rumold's kernel of strategy, a clear-eyed acceptance of what reality is. And then you have a policy and then you have an action plan. So you say, here's reality. What are we going to do about it? And so Stieglitz talks, leans into that. What he said was neoliberal economics had a strong belief that industrial policy was inappropriate and that the market would figure it out. And it would be better to leave, leave industrial policy to the market, not to the government. The West has found out that was wrong. We've left it to the market. We've left it to entrepreneurs. And as a result, we have a bunch of stuff which doesn't align well with the actual strategic needs of the world at this point. For better or for worse, China has had an industrial policy that's been very clear-eyed and very focused for 40 years or so. And now they are the world's only scale manufacturer of a lot of the technologies we need to decarbonize because they accepted climate change. And while they're costed for spreading as much carbon as they should, and we should hold their feet to the fire on that, they were also very clear in the 2000s, we've got hundreds of millions of people still in poverty. We've got to take them out of poverty first, get to the point where we are addressing our population in means other than one child policy. And at that point, we can start decarbonizing. And we're getting to that point. To be clear, uh, Sinopec, probably the world's largest refining and distribution of gasoline and diesel products, Inez Major. Mm -hmm announced this year peak gasoline in China, ahead of yes. two years ahead of when they expected. The Lantau Group, which has Mandarin speakers like David Fishman, they actually read Chinese governmental and industry documents in Mandarin and actually can get access to the information and pay attention and talk to experts there. And their percept their projection is China will peak coal burning next year in 2024. And right. once again, that's ahead of schedule. China's renewables program is expected to hit 2030 targets. I'll pick a specific industry, the wind industry. Europe and the United States created wind energy. China has built vastly more of it than any other country, more wind energy than the rest of the world combined every year. And now Goldwind and other Chinese firms are selling equivalent quality wind turbines globally with equivalent maintenance downtimes and equivalent mean time between failures and equivalent generation for less cost. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a situation now, just as with solar panels, China owns the market. With wind turbines, we're seeing a transition. And so there's a lot of angst about this challenge in the wind industry, but it's a European and North American challenge, especially a European challenge, not a global challenge. I then asked Michael about electric cars. We're seeing that transition now as well. 
Well, you mentioned BYD. Tesla builds more than half of the cars it sells every year in China. China is already buying 60 or 67 percent of all the electric cars sold every year, and it's selling them everywhere. I've driven a BYD in New Zealand. They're showing up in Europe. As I said to a group of Chinese business executives, the purchasing power parity and rights law advantages they hold will overcome things like the carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, in the EU. The only thing that will keep them out is rampant protectionism, and we're seeing that emerge right. now. They're protecting their economies. China is electrified vastly more of its economy than most of the rest of the world, and it is continuing to do so. 1.1 million electric buses and trucks, 42,000 kilometers now of high-speed electrified freight and passenger rail, another 10,000 coming, and more heat pumps than Europe and North America by combined, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What that means is as they build more renewables, their carbon footprint drops radically. They also have all those technologies to sell. And we need to buy them, and we need to buy them at reasonable prices. So in the West, we're in a bit of a catch-22. Lack of industrial policy, plus you know, not allowing things like rarest processing and battery technologies and manufacturing of consumer electronics all diverged to China. China willingly took that on. Now it's very difficult for us to retrench and catch up. I guess the question is, yeah, whether or not there's a premium that policymakers, certainly from the public purse, are going to be willing to kind of plop down and whether or not that's going to be sustainable. You hear the the former and perhaps future president of the United States go to Detroit and say that your entire industry is, is gone, your jobs will be gone if you allow the transition to continue because all the EVs have been made in China. Even though it seems like the UAW has reached a settlement with Ford today, it's not completely daft that because of the great advantage that has been built up but the resistance of the incumbents of your Stellantis's, your Fords and GM's to make the transition sooner. It's either consumers wind up paying more under protectionist policies in Europe and North America than they would otherwise have to, or kind of industrial decay with all the social and political things that go with it in some of these places. So I guess that's, you're kind of smiling and and sort 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 of grinning. I'm guessing that means that we're likely to just see more of that because ultimately the market's going to determine that the lowest cost is going to win out. Well, but let's tear apart a couple of things just just briefly here. Um, As we think about this, we're all starting with reality. Populist politicians are starting with reality and they have a strategy. Their policy is we're going to exploit the ignorant and the aggrieved for political power. And we're going to sell them to fossil fuel oligarchs to get money. And we're going to prevent the transition. That is actually policy. It's amoral, it's unethical, it's venal. There is no positive thing to say about it. But many uh, populist politicians today are very clear-eyed about reality. They just don't care about anybody else. If you haven't read Ray Dalio's Changing the World Order, I recommend it to your listeners. Uh, He has a a very long-running view of the stages of empires. The forms and structures and tactics of empires have changed, uh, but the United States was an empire. It replaced the British Empire, which replaced the Dutch Empire. The Soviet Union attempted to be an empire with, uh, on a world stage and failed. The United States is at the end of the cycle, and China's the beginning. And China's gone through the cycle five or six times over the past 3,000 years. And so as we look at that, we're going through that transition, and unfortunately or fortunately, we're doing it at a time when we need to take climate action. So we have multiple conflicting, it's a wicked problem of perception. An economy which chooses to remain on fossil fuels, or a business which maintains fossil fuels in its value stream, will fundamentally be uneconomic in the global economy. The costs will go up. The EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism has a budgetary cost of US $203 in 2030, approaching $300 in 2040 and 2050 per ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent. Anything, just take natural gas, for example. That's 14 bucks more per gigajoule when natural gas is a $5 per gigajoule commodity. So it's going to multiply right. by a factor of four, and that's going to get priced. So here, here's another question, then, the discourse about COP as we go through the next month, as we go into Dubai. Does it matter, or is it a sideshow? It matters. It's frustrating. It's Why? annoying. It's irritating. Um, it's obviously being captured by the fossil fuel industry. Um, the current chair, I, I, I think it's... Uh, sends exactly the wrong message globally to people who care. And I don't think that the process has been effectively shielding itself from the fossil fuel industry. At the last one, there were more representatives of the fossil fuel industry than of any country. And that's kind of indicative 
of how the fossil fuel industry ranks it as a threat. They're not sending people there because they want to participate. They're sending people there to avoid the implications and to find current competitive intelligence, to find out where the risks are, to influence people, to delay, to create messages about hydrogen and carbon capture and sequestration being you know, solutions, mm -hmm. working hard to prevent the transition. And the number of people they send in COP is indicative. They still consider it one of the greatest threats. And so that's part of the narrative. The other part of the narrative is that actually useful people who are actually committed to transition do get together and they do make things happen. And the COP is the annual initiative around the UNIPCC effort. And reality doesn't care about your, fat, your, your feelings. The UNIPCC's reports, and they're the most rigorous form of evidence, their systemic reviews released every four to five years of all the evidence around. We think of the pyramid of evidence. That's the very top. Opinion, like mine, is the very bottom. You know, actually, YouTube is below that. We get into case studies where, oh, here's an example, which I lean on because it's useful and it's communicative. We get into um, controlled studies with a control group and an actual group. We get into, you know, uh, then we get into various levels up and we get up to that systemic review. And that's what the UNIPC is. Now, then a lot of lobbying is done by the fossil fuel industry to include CCS in it, the carbon drawdown mechanism, and to weaken the wording and to challenge stuff so that it gets turns into a baffle gab. But still, if you read the UNIPCC reports, they're reality. They're reality-based, mm -hmm. and the modeling is reality-based. And so it's driving that, what Kahneman calls system two thinking throughout the process. Mm -hmm. It's working. It's ugly. There's two steps forward, one step back, um, but it is, we are moving forward. One of the things I've found really interesting to watch become far more public in its role is the IEA. Akshat Ratti from Bloomberg has done a great job with the chapter in his new book about Fatih Barol and his background and making that very accessible to a wider audience. The role that the IEA has played behind the scenes and increasingly in front of the scenes in helping to shape consensus even outside of the any one member state can veto agreement at COP. But hearing Jim Ski talking the other day, the, the chairman of the IPCC, that we're likely to see this trebling of renewables target be one of the headlines that comes out of this COP, if they're lucky, a doubling of efficiency, 75% methane reduction, that the only one of the three that would have anything to do with the, usually the core discussions around, around COP the loss and damage discussions that have simply collapsed last weekend that, that seem to be mired somewhere. And I think you've also got a whole rank of middle-income countries in South America and Africa that are very keen to get their oil and gas deposits to market before they're no longer of any value. But the IEA does seem to have been coming a lot more sophisticated in steering consensus around what can be done, even at the expense of the perfect. So I don't know what your views are on the IEA and how how they may have changed over time. I read some things you wrote about them a couple of years ago, and I think they're a little less benign than some of the things you might think, be thinking right now. So Fatty Barol, you know, joined in 2015 or 2016, took, took the leadership role. And um, I would say that he has done an amazing job of uh, being at the head of a massive, ultra-large crude carrier and turning the wheel an inch a year. The IA was formed, I think, in 1974, and it's explicitly formed as a fossil fuels organization. A tremendous number of the analysts in there are fossil fuel analysts. It's got a tremendous culture of paying attention to fossil fuel. I'll compare and contrast. The United States Department of Energy is 55% nuclear energy budget and efforts. They see things through a lens. Now, Burrell uh, right. yeah, has been working hard to reduce that problem, but he's yanking hard on the helm and he's slowly getting there. Certainly in the past, um, people like uh, Aki Hoekstra out of uh, Europe had tremendous fun publishing the dozen years of renewable projections the IEA made and showing that they all turned into an exponential curve, but the IEA kept consisting on flat line projections. And so the IEA has gotten to the point where they actually are taking the criticism seriously and they're actually moving. In the past few weeks, I've been looking more grid stuff. I spoke to a couple of hundred global institutional investors through Jeffrey's Bank about 
why electricity and why the grid and why they have to be paying more attention. Because Jeffrey's bank gets that the grid has been severely underinvested. in. Well, the IEA's report, they're patting themselves on the back. They say it's the first of a kind global grid assessment. It begs the question, because it's been obvious that grid investments have, and interconnections have been necessary for years, why the IEA has only come to the table today? Why they've been so slow right. to recognize that HVDC is the new pipeline and that electrons, moving electrons across borders makes a lot more sense than moving molecules across borders. There is the guide code, G-E-I-D-C-O, the Global Energy Interconnection Development Corporation, formed in 2016 yeah. by the top levels in China. The head of China's national grid is the executive chairman of GuideCo. It has 141 member countries, and it's been releasing annual reports on the global grid for years. It's the only organization of its kind in the world. China only got there in 2016, but that's seven years ago. The IEA only got there this year. Right. So this is indicative that people are starting to pay attention, but one organization, one geography has said, we need to do something about this. We need to establish an organization. We need to bring member countries together and we need to collaborate in bringing electrons across borders. The West is once again catching up. We, because of some of our developmental challenges around how utilities evolved and the fact that we have a legacy, um, I'll make an analogous comparison. Um, you probably know that in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, many, many, many people have cell phones, smartphones. And there are almost no people with, there are almost no wired phones. They just kind of missed that internal thing and went to the much more efficient wired phones. China is looking at some of the legacy development. We in the West, our utilities developed from cities, from very tiny things, and grew up from tiny to big. They've got a different model and they can adapt and change. So they're more used to sending more electricity longer distances, and they've got fewer barriers. We're not overcoming those barriers because... In many cases, utilities and regulatory regimes have calcified here. It's very difficult for them to change, and it's very difficult often for the people inside them to realize the need for change. Mm -hmm. our, our utilities, I, I bless them. They're insanely good operational organizations, but the last time they were asked to transform was probably 30 years ago. They don't have transformation resources inside. And I suppose that's one of the sticking points in the, the permitting question, having the kind of reform of decision-making the, the system just seems completely calcified, as you say. So you, I guess you're not holding out a lot of hope that we're going to get any breakthroughs on that anytime soon, certainly North America or Europe. No, I, 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 I'm I seeing signs of light. In northeastern United States, there's now regional grid planning among the utilities. There is an emergent harm understanding of that need. Among other things is I was chatting with Case Plett of DNV yesterday, uh, and the offshore wind pipelines that are going to come in are bigger than any of those local grids can actually absorb. They just have more power in them. So they have to find a way to examine that and deal with that buffer. And so they are emerging. Everybody recognizes, many people recognize the problem. In the West, we don't have a lot of people actively focused and given the mandate to solve the problem. The there, I had hoped to find an organization in the um, EU because it's a great Brussels example right? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, we need all of the EU to have a single strategic plan for transmission. That sounds like something that Brussels would do, but they're not. That doesn't mean we won't. It doesn't mean we're not overcoming barriers in the West. Mm -hmm. It's just, we're not as good at it yet. One of the things that, that you've spoken a lot about already is carbon capture and storage and the role that it has played in the discourse as being a, a distraction and delaying tactic. I had a very interesting conversation recently with the founder of an enhanced rock weathering startup that's doing pretty well. I've read some of the things you've written about carbon removal as distinct from CCS. Putting DAC aside, are there any pathways for carbon removal that you think are not a misallocation of capital, or is it all, in your view, just more and more distraction? There are some niche places in industry where CO2 is produced even after we electrify. And we need the commodity. The big one is cement. You know, right now, our mm -hmm. biggest source of quick lime is heating up limestone. And chemically, that turns it in, that takes some of the carbon in the uh, limestone, binds it with oxygen from the air, and turns it into carbon dioxide. That's about two-thirds of the emissions of, from cement. It 
does make sense because it's one of our biggest commodities and we depend on it to consider that a we're going to have a higher price point for that carbon dioxide that it might pencil out for carbon capture on cement plants but we have many other uh, solutions for cement which will also potentially pencil out right now they don't pencil out because we are still permitting ourselves to use the atmosphere as an open sewer as soon as we start mm -hmm. bolting carbon capture and sequestration on it and allowing that to compete with alternatives, some places for carbon capture and sequestration will make sense. But very, very few. We're not going to be bolting it to generation plants. Like electricity generation plants is just dumb as a box of rotting purple hammers. Made of clean coal. <laughs> Made of clean coal. Um, we're not going to be doing direct air capture. We're not going to be doing mineral weathering. The time scales for mineral weathering. It, mineral weathering requires us to mine massive amounts of rock, crush it with energy, and spread it far and wide. But where is the energy going to come from? Why are we going to spend all that energy when we could, with the same money, just put a few more wind turbines up and get much better value in terms of avoiding any CO2 emissions and plant a few trees? The Most of the mechanical or mineral-based carbon capture things are just vastly out of scale and we have to scale. The numbers I like to use is we put um, about a, a thousand billion tons of excess CO2 in the atmosphere over the past 300 years. So we've added 50% to what was there around 1700. Um, mm -hmm. And every year we're adding another 40 billion thousand or 40,000 billion tons, whatever, yeah, 40,000 billion tons, 40 gigatons, 40 gigaton every year to that massive amount of CO2 and mm -hmm. all of carbon capture and sequestration today is about 230 million tons, about 0.6 of the annual problem, never mind the global problem and 90 million tons mm -hmm. of that carbon capture and sequestration is actually taking fossil sequestered CO2 from underground and putting it back underground somewhere else, mostly for enhanced nice. oil recovery. In actual fact, all of the 230 million tons practically is taking fossil fuels or fossil CO2 out and putting it back underground. Sleepner is a, an Equinor example. They get too much CO2 with their natural gas. Mm -hmm. So they take the natural gas off and they take the CO2 off, they put the CO2 back underground and harvest tax breaks with that. And then when the natural gas is burned, it emits 25 times as much CO2 as what they burnt. And methane, of course, is a carbon bomb anyway. Um, there's a Shoot Creek facility that ExxonMobil brags about 7 million tons a year. They pump CO2 up from underground. They pipe it a few tens of kilometers. They push it underground for enhanced oil re extraction. They get more oil out, and when they burn the oil, when we used as directed on the box, gets more CO2 out of the process, and they acclaim tremendous knowledge and virtue for the shell game. That is carbon capture and sequestration. That doesn't mean it has to be that way, but it doesn't mean we should permit it to be that way. Okay. Well, I'm going to put you down as a skeptic then on... Uh... Enhanced rock weathering. Next time I'm talking to the guys at Undo, I've only looked at multiple. I've gently. only looked at multiple mineral weathering things, and they're all nonsense. So, so I guess the last question that that I wanted to ask: Are there three things that you'd recommend to our listeners that have shaped, or indeed reshaped, your views on climate or climate tech? Think things you might have read, watched, or listened to. Uh, yeah, I, I I would recommend um, two books I've already recommended. And they're not climate tech books. They're not climate change books. They're not solutions books. Uh, first is Richard Rummel's Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Read that, understand the kernel, and every time you look at it, say, is this a good strategy or a bad strategy? Is it starting from reality? If it is, is the policy one that's actually going to have climate action? Two, Ray Dalio's Changing World Order. We are in a time when, as Stiglitz said, we really need to be cooperating, and we're failing to do that. And a lot of that is due to the geopolitical realities Understanding that and understanding those variances is strongly helpful. And finally, I would recommend uh, Kishore Madhubani's Has China Won? Now, Kishore Madhubani is 
uh, was Singapore's head diplomat for a long, long time. And I lived in Singapore for a couple of years and I know I love the city. I think it's an amazing state. But PM Lee was the advisor to world leaders globally. He was insanely mm -hmm. insightful, brilliant, and did an amazing job with a tiny resource poor nation state to make it one of the richest in the world. And he had an impact on Mao, Deng Xiaoping, and other Chiinese leaders until he passed. The Kishore Mahabani was mm -hmm. his head guy, worked UN, worked China, worked the USA. And so for people who are hearing a constant drumbeat of negative things about China, Kishore Mahabani's book is a good um, way to introduce some reality to the discussion. That's super helpful. I'm not familiar with the third one. I'm definitely going to be checking it out as soon as we get off the air, as it were. Thank you so much. It's been such a, it's a wild ride. Great conversation uh, from my point of view anyway. And you've done now 15 pieces in Forbes, a distillation of, of things you've been working on for a long time. Uh, the natural thing would be to put them together in some sort of dead tree format. Is that uh, in your future? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, and when I was discussing with uh, B.F. Nagy uh, just yesterday, he was in town to do some publicity stills and video with me and a couple of other contributors to a book that will be coming out next year. So I'm in the book. Um, Mark said Jacobson has a chapter. Bill McKibben has a chapter. It's, a, it's going to be an interesting book. As he and I were saying, at a certain point, it becomes inevitable. Written so much. One of the big global publishers reached out to me at least briefly while I was in digital nomading in New Zealand. I expect mm -hmm. at some point in the next couple of years, something's going to emerge, but I'm not pursuing it personally. That's kind of the nature of the beast. I'll continue to do what I do, which is to explore different portions. And Forbes is a good outlet for me because I'm forced to generalize and remove a lot of the math and nerdiness from my publications to make it more accessible to a broader audience. We've succeeded massively in that. I, I think it's reaching an audience that uh, you know, really does need to hear. It's cutting through. It's well-written, clear. I've recommended it to the people I work with, and I'll continue to recommend it to our listeners as the series. And then final, final question, Michael, before I let you go, is I read also something you wrote back in May about how you were planning on having a dinner with Michael Liebreich and uh, Laurent Seligan, that uh, you were going to be just debating long-term hydrogen storage versus biomethane and HVDCs. Anything you could tell us about? how that dinner went? Oh, it was a great dinner. Lee Breikin's course is a force of nature. Segalin is a brilliant raconteur. Um, we were in the Shard on the 41st floor in London, looking at the sun setting over the Thames and the massive um, wheel that they have in the skyline, whatever it's called. It was truly stunning. Walls of glass. We were all just completely children. I mean, we had no cool at all. We were all taking pictures out the windows. Just fun, fun, fun. But <laughs> The conversation was brief on those points, but good. Um, and I, I've seen movement in version 5.0 of Liebrich's hydrogen ladder that he's saying he's holding out hope for hydrogen for long storage. He's not closing the door on it, but he's also seeing that other things are also candidates for that. And the way I would articulate it for your listeners, his hydrogen ladder, all the energy stuff, mostly it's all yellow because there are alternatives, mostly electrification. And the characterization I make now is that hydrogen for energy is a game of snakes and ladders where it's all snakes. So it's all going to collapse to the bottom rung. But hydrogen for long duration storage, um, what we're really talking about here is ultra long duration storage. There's same day, there's, you know, season the next day. And this seasonal, by the way, is not every season. The Chris Llewellyn Smith's modeling for the UK says every 10 years, you have a problem. And in a continent, it's every 50 to 100 years. And the question is, how do you manage for that strategic thing? It's a different economic thing. It doesn't have to compete on a per kilowatt hour basis because it's societal avoidance of a, of, of a big risk. Not a problem we have to solve initially. And my perspective is very simple. There's nothing about hydrogen that screams it's the answer for long duration storage. It's still expensive. It's still leaky, still hard to manage. Why wouldn't we just use existing anthropogenic sources of biological methane, which is easier to store, which is denser, which doesn't leak nearly as much. And we mm -hmm. have to take out of all those places that are emitting it and put it somewhere, do something with it. That seems like a good use case for that. Even if we just put natural gas in, into those things, as Paul Martin says, if we're burning natural gas for two weeks a year, every 10 years, we're way ahead of the game. Well... I mean, we have, Michael Lieber, I guess, not with us to give his point of view on it, but I, I'm sure that uh, maybe at some future date I can ask him. But listen, I, I'll, I think maybe we'll leave it there. Michael, thank you so much. Been such great pleasure talking to you. Richard, it's been a pleasure. It's, um, you know, you've done your homework in preparation for this. Your questions and insights and quotes were bang on and very useful in moving the conversation forward. So I, I wish I was as good an interviewer as you are. That's very kind. 
Well, I find that to be a fascinating conversation with Michael Barnard. I'm really pleased that he could join us. You'll find links to some of his writing on Forbes and Clean Technica and other places in the show notes. And he is an absolutely worthwhile follow on LinkedIn. You will not be disappointed in some of the repartee, shall we say. Um, if you're hearing that snorting in the background, that is Django, our chief canine officer here at Wicked Towers, um, letting us know that it's time to wrap up this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Find us at news.wickedproblems.uk. You can find more episodes there or indeed anywhere you can get quality podcasts, hosted by myself and Claire Brady. And check out our newsletter. Leave us some feedback. Tell us what more you'd like to hear in terms of topics or guests. If you're enjoying these conversations, do leave us a rating and review in the podcast store of your choice. It helps others to find the show. And have a fabulous weekend. I'll be back next week with our co-host, Claire Brady. Take care.